All right, thanks, Nishan. Um, so yeah, as Nishan said, I'm uh, really uh, excited to talk to you guys. Um, bright and early here from Los Angeles. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, uh, adult congenital heart. I, my slide went forward for some. Let me just make sure I can control these slides. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to be talking about catheter ablation in adult congenital heart disease. Uh, this was requested for me, and I, I have we have a lot of experience at UCLA with a fairly large adult congenital heart disease population. We follow about 4,000, I think, outpatients um, every year. Um, so hopefully some of the things that we've uh, sort of learned uh, will be useful for everybody here. So first of all, why, you know, the, the, first, the first question is what do we end up ablating in congenital heart disease? Um, it's almost, I mean, the vast majority of the catheter ablation procedures are for supraventricular tachycardia and mostly atrial arrhythmias, organized reentry and atrial arrhythmias. Um, we know that these, this is a major uh, problem in the congenital heart, adult congenital heart disease population. If you look at some of the data out of uh, Canada here, um, you know, the, uh, the reason for admission to the hospital is, is dominated by supraventricular arrhythmia in the adult congenital heart disease population um, and is a major health, public health concern. Um, it's also associated with um, uh, both increases in mortality, morbidity and mortality in terms of stroke, heart failure, and requirement for uh, various interventions, whether these are cardiac or interventional, uh, cardiac surgery or uh, interventional procedures. Um, so it's, a, it's got a lot of relevance to uh, clinical care uh, for the adult congenital heart disease population. So it's a, um, a, big, a big concern. Uh, congenital heart disease does affect 1% of children, and the vast majority of these patients, these kids, are now living into adulthood. Um, and if you look at the survivors uh, into adulthood, the, the, there's a 15% prevalence of uh, supraventricular arrhythmia, specifically atrial arrhythmia in adults with congenital heart disease. And um, in general, um, the risk is greater than the general population with acquired heart disease or uh, without heart disease. And um, another sort of uh, rule is, uh, a rule of thumb is that the anatomy determines the degree of risk. And so there's various categories of anatomical um, uh, anatomy and congenital heart disease. And I'll go over the ones that are associated with the greatest risk and we'll focus on those. Um, just to get to the, you know, a little bit of a historical context, uh, mapping and ablation for congenital heart disease dates back to the early 90s. A lot of this was done at UCSF. Um, um, and uh, some of the things that were noticed early on just were based on fluoroscopy, a uh, simple catheter feel, and uh, electrogram uh, recognition. So these are just a couple of the classic papers showing atriotomy circuits um, with uh, moving a roving catheter around the, uh, the atriotomy while you're in atriotomy dependent uh, flutter. And you can see, you know, this, this was described as you have split potentials that are widest uh, at the middle of the atriotomy and then converge uh, at either end. And so, um, you know, this is one of the first kind of uh, congenital heart disease um, specific papers to describe this. And then things like recognition of the uh, of patch material, what changes with the, what, what the impedance does when you're touching a patch and uh, how to recognize these kinds of circuits were all described actually very early on in, in, in the 90s. Uh, since then, obviously, things have changed quite a bit. We've got much better tools available uh, for mapping and for ablation. Um, one of the key papers, I think one of the, the key uh, sort of um, uh, features of, of reentry and congenital heart disease is the central obstacle is, um, is uh, <clears throat> important to recognize. And there's a, set, there's a limited number of types of obstacle that we see, uh, most common being uh, the AV valve annulus, whether it's a, mi a right-sided mitral valve like you see in CCTGA or a tricuspid valve, uh, but the right-sided AV valve tends to be common. Um, free wall scar, atriotomy circuits, atriotomy lines, and uh, even the ASD patch. And so this is just a study out of Boston very early also with 3D mapping showing the initial experience looking at the different types of uh, central opticals for reentry. And they found uh, that you know right AV valve tend to be the most common, followed by free wall scars, uh, crystal terminalis, and some, and then atriotomy and ASD patches. And uh, this is actually pretty, needs to be updated. I think this is pretty much the only paper in congenital heart disease to describe this, but it's uh, still fundamental to the way we we um, 
we map and ablate these patients. <clears throat> another, um, another thing, I mean, I'm sure everybody's familiar with dual loop reentry, uh, first described in France in 2000. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> I think it's worth remembering that dual loop reentry actually was first described uh, in this series in a, in a consecutive uh, series of ASD patients. So they all had atriotomy scars and uh, had dual loop reentry around the atriotomy and the tricuspid valve annulus. And so, um, again, congenital heart disease, very common to see dual loop reentry uh, circuits and um, important not to miss them when you're uh, mapping so that you can ablate all of the, uh, all of the reentry circuits in the patient. <clears throat> uh, so this is just an example. I'm gonna go through some of this and it sounds like you guys have talked about, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the different anatomical types, but this is a setting patient. Um, with uh, dual loop reentry around around a um, posterior uh, anastomosis here, so there's a sort of a counterclockwise circuit going around this posterior anastomosis in the pulmonary veins. You know, right in a, 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 clockwise, a clockwise circuit going around the uh, tricuspid valve, which is on the pulmonary venous side here. Um, this this one here is a uh, on the right side of the screen is a um, uh, Fontan patient, Bjork Fontan, who had a, a anastomosis between the right atrial appendage and the tricuspid valve, and had this linear scar on the free wall here with a circuit um, in, a, in a counterclockwise direction around that, and then clockwise around the Bjork anastomosis. Um, so just a couple examples of dual loop reentry, but we see this very frequently. Um, I did a case yesterday with dual loop reentry in a font, viral tunnel Fontan. So it's very, very common to see this. Um, let me see here. So other things to think about uh, specifically with congenital heart disease are, um, so we talked a little bit about central obstacles, but isthmus locations tend to be um, relatively preserved among the different anatomical subtypes uh, because they're based on prior surgical lesions. Obviously, if they have a diffuse scar or bad hemodynamics over time, they can develop um, alternate scars. But uh, in general, surgical uh, 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 lesion sets tend to be preserved. Um, uh, another thing to recognize in all heart disease is the, uh, is the altered AV conduction anatomy in some of the, um, some of the subcategories. So for instance, this is actually a, a prior uh, paper just describing the AV conduction system in um, congenital heart disease. And you can see this is a, in a, a sort of a description of a AV canal patient um, <clears throat> with the prime MASD and, and inlet VSD. And the, and the conduction system is displaced posteriorly uh, by necessity um, towards the um, uh, inferiorly uh, down towards the tricuspid valve annulus, sort of closer to the CTI than normal. So you gotta be really careful when you ablate with the AV canal not to damage the AV conduction system uh, because it's displaced. Uh, CCT, this middle one here is CCTGA and, and these patients actually have a duplicated uh, conduction system, but usually the dominant route of conduction is through a anterior AV node near the right atrial appendage, pulmonary valve, uh, 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 sort of connection there, um, uh, continuity there, and with a long tenuous conduction system that's very susceptible to AV block. And then uh, one of the more rare forms of altered conduction system anatomy is in, in heterotaxy syndrome, which I'll talk about if there's time, uh, but essentially you can get a conduction sling here that can, be, that can cause forms of SVT. Um, so it's very important to recognize the AV conduction system and the different congenital forms of anatomy, different uh, forms of congenital anatomy. Um, and then finally, uh, tachycardia mechanisms tend to be diverse. Um, focal tachycardias and, and reentry tach atrial tachycardias dominate, but um, you know we certainly see lots of, uh, especially with Epstein's anomaly, things like Maheim fibers and other kinds of pathway-mediated tachycardias. And then finally, tissue architecture is important, um, especially I think the Fontan patients are the most important ones where um, longstanding venous hypertension can cause uh, atrial uh, muscle hypertrophy and very thick tissue in some cases, up to almost a centimeter in thickness on the, on the venous side. Um, so, um, you know, getting a transmurality may be very difficult with some of the uh, Fontan patients and uh, you have to be very aggressive sometimes. So here's, the, here's a, another publication. This is also out of, uh, out of uh, Canada, I believe, but um, this is just showing you the prevalence of SVT uh, in a large population of congenital heart disease defects. And the ones I'm gonna focus on are the ones that sort of surpass the others here in this uh, bar graph. Uh, so transposition of the great arteries after the mustard or sending operation, very common to have SVT. 
Um, the univentricular hearts, also known as basically Fontan patients, have a very high incidence of, of uh, SVT as well. And then finally, Epstein's anomaly, probably the highest uh, in congenital heart disease. Um, I'll, I'll also speak about if we have uh, time uh, to get through that today. So DTGA, mustard, and sinning. Um, you know, this is a, um, a trait. Uh, so the mustard and sinning operation uh, was introduced very early on as the surgical approach uh, for uh, <clears throat> physiologic correction of transmission of the great arteries. Um, without surgery, these patients uh, will, uh, it basically is a fatal lesion within days to months after birth. Um, the ultimate goal was to achieve an arterial switch operation, but the, just due to technical issues and uh, bypass issues, early attempts failed. So there was a, a, a real push to do atrial redirection surgery. And in 1959, Senning proposed the full, um, the first full atrial re uh, redirection surgery. Um, and uh, that became the predominant um, operation until the, the mustard operation was introduced in 1964, at which point the, the mustard actually took over. Um, so I think you've already heard this uh, earlier this week, but the stenting operation involves a complex baffling of the SVC and IVC flow across an atrial septal communication over to the mitral valve. And this is done with native tissue. So the atrial septum is essentially uh, uh, is, is used as a flap and sutured around the pulmonary veins. And then uh, a counter incision on the, around the right side of pulmonary veins is anastomosed. After this is closed off, this is anastomosed over to the atriotomy to create a, a, um, a route of blood for the pulmonary venous return to go around the SVC and IVC into the tricuspid valve. Um, and so very elegant, uh, very creative design without any extra material, but it does involve a lot of suture lines. Um, if you also think about where the sinus node sits, um, the sinus node oftentimes ends up inside of the pulmonary venous baffle. Uh, so I think that's important to recognize that it becomes an internal structure after the sending operation. And so um, it's susceptible to uh, uh, trauma from catheter ablation if you're not aware of that. Um, the mustard operation, which was again uh, approximately five years later, uh, conceptually a lot simpler. Basically, you make a big atriotomy, uh, you resect the atrial septum, you suture on this, um, this uh, special, um, what they call the pantaloon shaped patch that redirects blood flow, like the sending from the SVC and the IVC, over to the mitral valve. Uh, but it's sewn around the pulmonary vein so that the pulmonary venous drainage, drainage is directed to, around that towards the tricuspid valve. And the whole thing is just closed off with a big patch. So it's actually con surgically easier to do this operation than the sending, and this actually became more favored. This was more favored after uh, it was introduced in 1964 out of Toronto. Uh, if you look at uh, follow-up after um, these operations, there's a really disappointing uh, propensity to uh, basically atrial flutter. Uh, with about 25% of patients uh, and the longest follow-up at 20 years out after the mustard operation. Um, so, you know, if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, they're not, you know, they're pretty, pretty dismal looking here. So about, you know, 25% of patients at 20 years. So it's pretty, and it's a progressive sort of problem with these patients. Uh, the um, arrhythmias uh, most commonly observed are, this is a schematic. So the pink is the pulmonary venous flow here, you got the pulmonary veins coming in, wrapping around the systemic venous atrium, going to the tricuspid valve here on the left, and then your SVC and IVC over to the mitral valve here on the right. Um, the isthmus between the tricuspid valve and the IVC, uh, despite the altered anat surgical anatomy, still is the most common site of, uh, of uh, ablation. So basically CTI dependent flutter is the most common target for these patients. And we saw that in this study uh, in the vast majority but you see some, in, especially the mustards around the free wall patch or atriotomy. And then focal tachycardias along the baffle are pretty common as well, as well as a few avian RTs you, can, you see from time to time. But the vast majority are these CTI dependent flutters. Um, we actually looked at you know, patients who had recurrences and where they were, and we saw only a few in the CTI, and actually these had not necessarily been ablated the first time. A um, couple focal tachycardias, and then this posterior anastomosis for the sending operation, if you recall, uh, there's a counter incision along the right pulmonary veins for the sending operation, and this is a site for recurrence in these patients. And so we've that taken to always going after this posterior anastomosis really carefully at the index op at the index procedure. 
So how do you get there? You know, we're talking about the CTI in most cases, but the CTI is in the opposite chamber, separated to, from you, uh, from the IVC by this baffle. Um, so to get there, you basically need to, you can, there's two ways you can go retrograde through the aorta, through, into the RV and back through the triclesive valve. But um, the direct route is to do a trans baffle puncture and that's favored in most um, centers. So that's um, what I'll show you next. But basically you come up from the IVC and you do this uh, puncture more anteriorly than usual um, and superiorly. And if you look at uh, the uh, fluoroscopic images here, this is a contrast injection from the IVC that fills uh, the um, systemic venous baffle over to the mitral valve. And then uh, here are the operators staining the uh, baffle with a needle. Um, and you can see this is directed basically superiorly and there should be an anterior bend uh, to this in most cases. Um, and so after staining that, you can get across uh, as any kind of typical um, transeptal procedure. But the, di the difference is really the, um, the orientation of the needle and the trajectory. And sometimes this baffle material can be quite thick and difficult to um, puncture through um, <clears throat> because it's uh, surgically placed. So here's just an example of a patient we had at our center uh, with, uh, uh, you know, I didn't mention this, but a lot of these patients have sinus node dysfunction as well. This patient had um, sinus node dysfunction, had recurrent episodes of uh, atrial flutter. Um, he was from, uh, I believe, Las Vegas and came out to see us. Um, we always do a hemodynamic cath on these patients before the catheter ablation procedure. Very important because um, they do develop problems with the SVC and IVC baffle. They also tend to develop baffle leaks. Uh, so you basically have atrial level shunting. And um, a lot of them have abnormalities in their uh, valves and uh, pressures due to, to the RV being a systemic RV. So anyway, this patient had a, a baffle stenosis here, uh, which I think is important when you take a look at the, uh, the angiograms. This is the baffle stenosis. So you can see the IVC is filled here, uh, baffle stenosis, but the baffle drains over to the mitral valve. And then to get to the circuit, which was for him was on this, in this chamber here, the pulmonary venous chamber, we, got, we did a, a trans baffle puncture, as I mentioned a second ago. So here's, a, here's the trans baffle puncture um, with ICE, uh, using ICE as uh, the way to, um, to, uh, to um, gauge the uh, needle location. <clears throat> and then this is the map. This is Rhythmia map. We've been using a lot of um, high definition mapping for these patients, but you can see here on this right side of view, this right lateral view, um, this patient's the pulmonary veins are coming in here. It has a large patch uh, along the right atrial free wall, which you see typically with these uh, with mustard patients. Um, and then there's a, there's some scarring along the septum um, between the uh, two the native the morphologic left atrium and the morphologic right atrium. All of this is pulmonary. We call this pulmonary venous atrium because it's draining the pulmonary veins to the tricuspid valve. Uh, so there's some some scar along here, and especially a dense scar along the right atrial free wall. This is just putting the SVC and IVC on as well, the mitral valve. And then um, pretty classic for him, I mean, for, for these patients had a pretty classic circuit. So he had a counterclockwise flutter circuit using actually in this case, um, portions of the morphologic uh, right atrium um, that are in the pulmonary venous chamber, as well as portions on the uh, systemic venous chamber down here. Um, and then he also had this um, clockwise so what looked like is it going to be a clockwise circuit around this atriotomy, but colliding with the other circuit here back by the pulmonary veins. Um, so not a true, I guess, dual loop circuit here, but what looks like if you didn't have this uh, faster circuit driving the secondary circuit, this could potentially operate independently, uh, and which turned out to actually be the case. So after we ablated the, um, the CTI dependent flutter, we induced a much slower tachycardia uh, whenever we tried to map it, it terminated. Whenever we tried to entrain in this area, it terminated. It had this just really long fractionated signal. So we ablated this atriotomy site here and um, the tachycardia slowed and terminated. It was not inducible. So I think, you know, keep in mind that these dual loop reentries are pretty common in congenital heart disease. I'd say probably 50% of cases seem to have uh, some sort of dual loop mechanism. Um, so this is just where we put the lesions for that patient. And then had a focal tachycardia as well that we went over afterwards. Went after everyone. This patient got a pacemaker, and then you know I'm not going to. I'm not talking about pacemakers today, but obviously this is a, this is not the usual location for pacemaker wires. Uh, but this is where we um, end up in in these patients. 
Again, uh, baffle leaks very common. We should be, you know, be doing TEEs with these cases because you don't want to get any um, uh, embolization and you potentially want to close these off as you're, um, as you're there anyway. So we often involve our interventionalists. Um, if, you, if you look at combining interventional procedures with uh, electrophysiology procedures in congenital heart disease, it makes a lot of sense in terms of um, uh, cost as well as things like anesthesia time, contrast dose, and hospital length of stay. Uh, but especially these mustards and sending patients, they have all kinds of issues that can be addressed by interventionalists. And so we oftentimes will get advanced imaging ahead of time and do a, a comprehensive cath at the time of the EP study just to make sure that we don't have uh, anything else to address beyond the EP issues, <clears throat> which is very common. All right, Fontan, the next category, Fontan operation. Um, the rationale here for this uh, surgery is essentially you have a single functional ventricle and you need to use that ventricle for the, um, the systemic pump. Um, and so because pulmonary blood flow can occur, generally can occur passively, uh, you simply need, not simply, but you need to bypass the heart uh, for, to establish um, pulmonary blood flow from the systemic venous return. The um, major types of Fontan are your atrial pulmonary Fontan, lateral tunnel Fontan and extracardiac Fontan. This is actually just a few of them. There's actually uh, several others. These, are, these dominate the, um, the types that we see. Um, <clears throat> and in general, this operation has saved you know, thousands of, of lives, but it is, it is complicated by arrhythmias as these patients age, um, as well as other forms of Fontan failure, which arrhythmia is only one of them. Uh, this is the classic Fontan operation as described by Fontan in 1971. It's also known as the cross your heart Fontan because the SVC flow is directed exclusively to the RPA and the uh, IVC flow through the right atrium is directed with a conduit, with the valve conduit to the LPA. Uh, turns out these patients get, don't have hepatic factor reaching the right lung and so they develop pulmonary AVMs. So nowadays uh, we use, uh, actually following that at least, uh, the modified atrial pulmonary Fontan uh, was used where you have direct connection of the right atrium to the pulmonary artery and this was the preferred approach for the Fontan for many, many years um, until the basically the late 80s. Um, unfortunately, this right atrial chamber dilates progressively with time and becomes extensively hypertrophied due to high, just generally high pressure. Fontan pressures are typically in the range of 10 to 15 millimeters, millimeters of mercury, um, which causes the right atrium to progressively uh, enlarge <clears throat> and hypertrophy. And so they, these patients have all any, I mean, uh, multiple different forms, uh, multiple potential um, reentrant circuits based on the uh, surgical anastomosis um, that's used, as well as um, some of the natural barriers. So there's actually a baffle that's placed from the right atrium here so that the right atrium doesn't, uh, so the blood flow does not enter the heart. So there's a baffle here that can serve as a, as a central obstacle. The AV valve annulus can serve as a central obstacle. The patch from the RA to PA can serve as one. Uh, an atriotomy scar can serve as one, and you can even get reentry on the SVC and IVC. This is one of the ones, this is one we had a year or two ago, um, which was quite difficult to ablate because uh, it was going around this patch to the pulmonary artery and a very large circuit. And then this, this isthmus here, which we targeted, uh, was, very, was very resistant to catheter ablation. I think the tissue is extremely thick. We did hundreds of lesions. Uh, before finally terminating here uh, and um, fortunately it remained durable, but this was a very difficult line to create uh, with um, lots of trabeculation and lots of thick tissue. Um, this is um, <clears throat> another example of a patient who had uh, uh, basically an, uh, almost a complete intercable line here, but had a gap um, and the circuit was going through that gap and around through the, uh, the, the isthmus between the SVC and the, the PA anastomosis. And we've seen that a number of times as well, um, where you have this uh, reentry through this area. And uh, you can target it here or you can target it along the free wall. Um, so um, something to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing, I think just looking at the, uh, the physiology here, remember how this right atrium dilates. The same thing happens to the IVC over time. And so um, the IVC dilation can be even, uh, can be so dramatic that, um, that you can see pericable reentry as well. And pericable reentry was described a while back uh, by uh, Ravi Mandapati back in 2003. 
Um, and it is a real mechanism. We see this from time to time in the spontan patients. So it's, uh, it's worth keeping in mind as well. So, you know, with all the problems that are associated with atrial pulmonary fontan, um, uh, people develop, people thought, okay, we need to find a better way to get uh, better fluid dynamics through the heart without causing this progressive right atrial dilation. It's actually a lot of energy loss in the right atrium when you have a direct connection to the PA. Um, and then also, how do we get less arrhythmia? And so it was proposed that we do what's called a lateral tunnel fontan, which essentially involves um, a small baffle through the right atrium um, from the IVC up to the SVC, and then the, S and the SVC would be then a mastinose to the PA. Um, this was um, <clears throat> generally accepted pretty quickly and um, uh, became the preferred approach. Uh, it was also associated with less arrhythmia and some of the early, even some of the early studies um, looking at this within the first you know, five to 10 years after the operation was introduced showed reduced arrhythmia as compared to the atrial pulmonary uh, fontan that we talked about earlier. Um, these patients do still get arrhythmia. Um, the predominant mechanism, I think, you know, this is not really uh, necessarily published, but in our own experience at least is circuits around the uh, AV valve annulus are very common as well as uh, the patch between the lateral, lateral tunnel fontan and the, the rest of the atrium uh, tends, to be a circuit, uh, tends to be a central obstacle for circuits, and finally the atriotomy. So um, those, three those three mechanisms are most common with the lateral tunnel fontan. Uh, this is a case where we had gone retrograde with stereotaxis to, to do the um, uh, left-sided ablation. <clears throat> this is another case, actually. This is a, a kind of a nice one showing um, you know, uh, both atria this is the SVC and IVC lateral tunnel fontan on the, this is patient had situs inversus. So lateral tunnels on the right here, the pulmonary venous chambers on the left, uh, on, well, I guess the patient's right, and this is on the left. And there's a circuit using this atriotomy, uh, actually used part of the pulmonary venous chamber uh, as well, uh, but you can see that there's this nice isthmus between the atriotomy and the IVC here where there was a, there was a, a first burn termination here uh, that was really nicely shown with this mapping system. Um, so uh, keep in mind atriotomy, uh, patch, and uh, AV valve annulus for these patients. <clears throat> this is just showing, this is actually just one of the studies we had put together a while back showing that this uh, ultra high definition mapping can be useful for uh, quickly identifying uh, uh, what we call troughs in, the global, in this uh, uh, histogram uh, so you can identify uh, conduction isthmuses. All right, so the most recent um, form of Fontan is the extracardiac Fontan. Um, this was further proposed to even, even, you know, even improve uh, the hemodynamics of the Fontan further, as well as to completely eliminate any kind of uh, alteration of the atrium uh, with the surgery so that you can potentially avoid uh, any arrhythmias altogether. And um, most centers are now doing the extracardiac Fontan um, for the past 20 years, 20 to 30 years. Uh, some, page, some centers are still using the lateral tunnel fontan. I know Boston still uses lateral tunnel fontan, but this is, this is probably the most uh, common approach now. Um, early studies did not show a difference, though, with the extracardiac versus lateral tunnel and other fontans, probably because they're underpowered and they're very early um, publications. But if you look at this uh, more recent study, I guess it's not that recent at this point anymore, but uh, the combined experience out of Australia and New Zealand, um, they did see that if you look down here at the bottom uh, here, with um, extracardiacs as the reference group, lateral tunnels had three times the um, incidence of SVT and atrial pulmonary fontans had almost 11 times the incidence of SVT. So extracardiac fontans are significantly less likely to have um, uh, supraventricular tachycardia um, as compared to the other subtypes. So unfortunately we still see SVT um, with um, extracardiac fontans. And the challenge now is that the SVT is uh, relatively remote from the, uh, the approach that we take, which is obviously from the IVC. These two structures are no longer in continuity and uh, it's a real, it can be a real challenge to get to the arrhythmia substrate. Um, <clears throat> we published this a few years, this is a multi-center study looking at, is this feasible to do an extracardiac fontans? There was actually some question of whether we can even do conduit punctures, uh, et cetera, to get to the substrate safely. Turns out it's, it, it, is, it does seem to be safe in experienced centers. Um, the, we also looked at the substrates uh, that these patients have for reentry, and it's, 
Interestingly, it tends to be very simple in most cases. Uh, periannular substrates tend to dominate, uh, as well as atriotomy uh, circuits tend to dominate this group. As far as how people were getting, this is from 2016, how these people were getting there. There was direct conduit puncture in the majority. Um, in some patients, like within an erupted IVC, uh, a transpulmonary puncture was used in a case. And then we had 